you survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting The Black Man with the Gun Show. This week on episode number 569. Is that right? Yeah. I want to introduce you to a gun that is not a firearm. The producer of Women's Outdoor News shares some inside baseball information about the Smith & Wesson 380 pistol, known as the Bodyguard. Attorney Andrew Branca, his feature on the law of self-defense, touches on a case from 2014 where the use of force involves the martial arts. And Michael J. Woodland, right on key, talks about fitness and the martial arts and how it all depends and how it all connects to you. All this and more coming up next. Blackmanwithagun.com Ken Blanchard's Pro Gun Podcast Actually, last week, I didn't think I was going to be here. I was supposed to be on vacation this weekend, me and the wife going away somewhere and uh, spend a little time together, make a little romance. Well, we got rained out, but the honeymoon still continues. I think I'll talk a little bit about marriage in our news segment. Right after this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color. What a week, what a week in the news. Our top stories this week. More than 100 people have died after a Boeing 737 airliner crashed near Cuba's main airport in Havana, the country's worst air disaster in decades. Mis condolencias. According to reports, three women were pulled alive from the wreckage, but are said to be in critical condition. The plane, like a lot of those that are over there, I think I've flown that one actually, are nearly 40 years old and carrying 105 passengers and six crew members. Cuban authorities have launched an investigation, and two days of national mourning have been declared. This happened on Friday, the 18th of May. And in Texas, the area called Santa Fe, a 17-year-old student confessed to opening fire at his Texas high school that same day, Friday, May 18th, killing 10 people, and told investigators after a protracted gun battle that he had spared certain students so he could have his story told. The Galveston County Sheriff's Office wrote an affidavit that this student waived his rights to remain silent and had given a statement admitting to shooting multiple people at Santa Fe High School. Before his arrest, he exchanged gunfire with police officers for about 15 minutes and abandoned what he said had been his intention to take its own life. Why would anybody do that? Our community is about to reel and bracing itself for not only mourning and grieving the loss of life, but the fallout from the laws that come afterwards for the law-abiding. What kind of person would do this? Usually it's a narcissist, a person with a huge ego, a sociopath, a person where consequences don't matter, where they believe they are their own God, and that's lowercase g, and they have no regard for life. Unfortunately, our society and our culture breeds this in our young people right now. Parents, I'm calling on you. You have to stay adults. You have to stay in charge, you have to become parents from birth until they're over 21. And then I dare challenge you to stay in their lives until they have their own families or they're at least out of your house. Parents, I'm calling on you. And then Saturday morning, bright and early, we had a royal wedding of an American and a Brit. And a wedding, a marriage, is a legal or formally recognized union of two people as partners in a personal relationship and historically, traditionally, and if done by me, between a man and a woman. Marriage is not for sissies. It's hard work. Marriage is not getting about what you want all the time. Marriage ain't rocket science. For the folks who love this stuff as a fantasy, as a fairy tale, please. Sorry, you princess wannabes out there, but uh, marriage is not for the impatient. It's not a place for criticism, for abuse. And if found there, it will ruin any chance of true intimacy or trust and dissolve the hope that once might have existed. And did I say it was hard work? Yeah. So while I'm journeying through here free of charge, let me just praise all those who are married and dealing with stuff and going through and making it work 
And for all you guys out there playing house with somebody, well, <laughs> and in conclusion, I like to wish the happy couple, Prince Harry and Meghan, all the best. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Crossbreed holsters are some of the finest holsters in America. They are imitated for a reason. They sell holsters, belts, modular systems. The U.S. company that my friend Mark Craig had started in 2005 has been a supporter for you and I for almost a decade. Crossbreed holsters has raised the standard for customer service in the holster industry through its two-week tried-free guarantee and a lifetime warranty. You tried the rest, now get the best. Go to crossbreedholsters.com. And tell them, Ken sent you. Crossbreedholsters.com Thanks for joining us for the Law of Self-Defense Case of the Week. I'm attorney Andrew Branca for LawofSelfDefense.com. This week's Case of the Week is State v. Iverson out of the Idaho Court of Appeals in a decision handed down in 2014. It involves a prosecutor who successfully uses a defendant's black belt in Taekwondo against him in criminal trial for battery against the victim of his use of force. The victim in this case heard that his ex-girlfriend had gotten into an altercation with her new boyfriend, the defendant in this case. The victim and a large male friend drove to the apartment where the girlfriend and defendant lived together. And as the male friend sat in the car parked at the curb, the victim stood outside beside the car talking on the phone. The defendant approached, grabbed the victim's phone and threw it in the street and initiated a verbal altercation. The victim's friend emerged from the car and approached them, at which point the defendant punched the victim in the face. That single punch would result in multiple facial fractures and require surgery and the insertion of titanium plates and screws to repair the damage. The defendant was charged with battery and subjected to a jury trial. In that trial, the defendant would testify in his own defense, and his legal defense was self-defense. In particular, he would argue that although he didn't actually feel threatened by the victim specifically, he felt threatened generally when the victim's large friend approached them. This decision noted that, quote, the defendant testified that he felt it necessary to punch the victim because he could not turn his back on the victim in order to defend himself against the victim's friend, close quote. At trial, the prosecution wanted to emphasize to the jury the extent of the victim's injuries, arguing that the severity of the injuries demonstrated that even if the defendant had been justified in using some force in self-defense, the actual degree of force he used was excessive. Recall that force is categorized in terms of its intensity by placing it into one of two buckets, the deadly force bucket or the non-deadly force bucket. The deadly force bucket includes, naturally, force capable of causing death, but it's actually defined more broadly than that to include force capable of causing serious bodily injury. The other bucket is the non-deadly force bucket, which simply includes all lesser degrees of force. Now, as a general legal principle, the element of proportionality of a self-defense claim requires that a defender can use deadly defensive force only to stop a deadly force attack. If the defender is facing only a non-deadly force attack, he's limited to using only non-deadly defensive force. If deadly defensive force is used against a non-deadly attack, that defensive force is disproportional, excessive, and unlawful. The prosecution's argument in this case is essentially that the severity of the injuries suffered by the victim qualified as serious bodily harm, and that placed the defendant's force into the deadly force bucket of intensity. In order for that use of deadly defensive force to be justified, the defendant must have been facing a deadly force threat. Although the defendant may have been facing some degree of threat from the victim and his friend, the prosecution argues that there was zero evidence in this case that the defendant was facing a deadly force threat. As a result, they argued, his use of deadly defensive force, force capable of causing the victim's serious bodily injury, was disproportional, excessive, and unlawful. The defendant countered this argument by the prosecutor by claiming that the intensity of the injuries caused by his one punch 
was essentially a freak event and that he had no reason to believe that the resulting injuries would be so severe. After all, most barehanded punches do not cause death or serious bodily injury, so he should be permitted to believe his punch would not do so and that therefore his punch only qualified as non-deadly force. This is where the defendant's martial arts training is brought into the argument by the prosecutor. During closing argument, the prosecutor made the following statement, quote, now, I'm not a doctor, I don't have medical training, and I don't if, and know if any of you do, so I don't know exactly what we're talking about, but I do know that we're talking about numerous fractures. We're talking about some serious bodily harm. I would submit to you that this is excessive force, and I would also submit to you that the defendant, given the kind of training he had as a black belt in Taekwondo, understood that this is the sort of thing that's going to result from the blow that he landed. He acknowledged that he's been doing this for a long time. Close quote. The defendant objected to the statement at trial, but it was permitted by the trial judge. After the defendant was convicted and he appealed his conviction, in part on this claimed error, the appellate court in this decision agreed with the trial judge in affirming the defendant's conviction, ruling, quote, the prosecutor's statement was a permissible inference from the evidence presented at trial. Specifically, the defendant testified he was a first-degree black belt in Taekwondo and had been trained in proper technique and control in regard to how to properly punch someone. Based on this training, it was reasonable for the prosecutor to infer and argue to the jury that the defendant knew the potential seriousness of the injuries he could inflict on the victim with a punch to the face. Close quote. So if you've ever wondered if your martial arts training could be, quote, used against you in court, the answer is almost always going to be yes. If by used against you in court, you mean introduced into evidence by the prosecution in order to make you look bad to the jury. But that's not an argument for not getting training. It's not prudent to limit your ability to win the physical fight merely out of concern that it might be used against you in the legal fight. It is an argument, however, for recognizing that if you do have specialized knowledge, training, skills, or experience, you can and will be held to the legal standard of someone who possesses such specialized knowledge, training, skills, and experience. So conduct yourself accordingly. As always, I encourage all of you to read this case in its entirety, and you can do that by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash Iverson. That's I-V-E-R-S-O-N. If you enjoy this content, I invite you to join us for the Law of Self-Defense live show every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. It's totally free to either participate live or to watch the recording after each show. For more information, point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash show. Remember, you carry a gun so you're hard to kill. Know the law so you're hard to convict. I'm attorney Andrew Branca for lawofselfdefense.com. Next up is the best co-host I've ever had. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland, and today we're going to discuss how important is exercising in relation to shooting firearms. The question of how important is exercising in relation to shooting firearms has been asked of me many different times. Depending on who I talk with and the audience is how I will answer. The simple answer is exercise plays an important part of our lives outside of training with a firearm. Those who exercise regularly have a less chance of getting sick and injured than those who don't. The results of exercise will be positive overall. Now I know a few people are thinking that they do not have the extra funds or will to sign up for a gym to lift weights, get a training coach, or even do jiu-jitsu. But don't fret. You can still get a quality workout in at no cost. Simply walking at least three times a week, starting at three miles each of those days, is a good start. Of course, each week, add more distance at your discretion to keep it challenging. If you feel walking is too easy of a task, then try go swimming and do a couple laps, but don't cut yourself short. Either swim for a defined amount of time or repetitions. 
There are a ton of activities you can do that will add an extra benefit to your everyday life around the realm of exercise. Just use your imagination and get creative. Now, of course, do not forget to do your daily dry fire drills, mag reload drills, and drawing from the holster. After a while, you will think all this is not paying off, but your performance will speak for itself, whether at competition or just shooting with some friends. Trust me, the effort will show in your performance. For those who follow me on social media, you see I train every day with jiu-jitsu, and that is a great full-body workout that works all muscle groups while training. Outside of the physical stress the workout gives to your body, it also forces you to think at the same time. Even if you tap out, that is a win-win, especially when you see how it will affect your way of thinking off the mats. Depending on what competition is coming up, I do add riding a bicycle and swimming in addition to jiu-jitsu. I do realize how important it is for me to work out in relation to shooting and what I do with shooting and my everyday life as well. Then again, one of my hashtags I use is hard to kill, and I stay hard to kill by exercise and constant training. When you add working out to training, or just shooting firearms, you will see how you perceive the challenge to be more fun. If you want to come out to Columbia, South Carolina and do a week's training session with me and my workouts, come on down and I will get you jump started on a positive track. But if you take me up on this offer, make sure you bring your guns and enough bullets for some fun on the range. For those who are looking to contact me, visit blackmanwiththegun.com and Under the About tab, click on my name, Michael Woodland, and shoot me an email or phone call. Please leave a voicemail or text message, and I promise I will get back to you. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. A few years ago, a friend of mine started this thing called the United States Concealed Carry Association. It's an education, training, and self-defense insurance company now. It's for responsible gun owners. You can get complete peace of mind when you join USCCA today. If you carry a gun for self-defense, you need this. It's a whole package, education, training, and self-defense insurance. Call my friend. The number is 1-877-488-8353. And if you missed that, go to the link at blackmailthegun.com for USCCA. This next conversation is done in stereo so that if you have one earbud, it might sound a little funky. Just giving you a warning. Barbara, welcome back to the show. Mm-hmm. My pleasure. Last week, you talked about a 380 in particular that you were reviewing, and you were talking about some of the specs for it and how it was not made for sometimes the people that actually you see in the book. Let's talk about it for what the purpose of this 380 and what it is um, and why you thought it was a cool pistol in particular. Yes, I believe it was built to address problems of arthritis, small hands, new shooters, and those who cannot and know not how to manipulate a slide very well. So Why? It, is, it is so easy to rack the slide on this thing. I took it to the well-armed woman class for dry fire practice and we have several grannies in there. No problem. Two out of the nine women who are interested in it have already purchased that gun. And that was just two months ago that they, they saw it. Wow. So I do believe that Smith & Wesson is looking at the baby boomer market, and they decided that they wanted to improve the M&P line and improve this particular 380. You know, they have that bodyguard in 380, that, that model. But mm-hmm. this is – and so people – it, it really was a shock to the firearms world when they came out with this. Nobody had a clue that they were going to do this. Because everyone thought, oh, they got the bodyguard. Everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. So what, which model is this one? This is the M&P 380 Shield EZ. And EZ is because it's easy to rack and it is easy to shoot. It is, it's more like a nine. My husband said, this seems like a nine millimeter because the, the barrel and the overall frame is a little bit longer than the standard 380. And it's very slim. Hmm. So I'll tell you, it's 1.43 inches across its widest part, and it's 6.7 inches long overall for the entire gun. 
that's about one one point one inches longer than most of its competitors, like um, you know the Rugers mm-hmm. in three eighties or. Uh, what else would we be looking at in a 380? Oh, God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit more slim and a little longer. And um, the other thing, it has three safety mechanisms. I talked about that last time. It has an oh, internal yeah. safety. And then it has an optional manual bilateral thumb safety, which a lot of people really like. Of course, you have to train with it, but they really like having that additional fit safety. And then especially if they carry it in a bag or something, you know. Mm. And then uh, there's also a grip safety. And here is the little problem with that. With a grip safety, you really do have to squeeze that grip. It's like a 1911. You really do have to learn how to, how to squeeze on your um, strong hand with, with the gun to activate it. Hmm. The gun I liked the most that was like that was at H&K, the um, mm-hmm. P7, I think it was. Mm-hmm. But after you got used to being just death grip on that thing, you could actually relax. Yes. And so could the grannies. After they learned how they had to hold it, they did it. They could do it. So that told me that this gun could work for them. It could work for people with, with uh, strength problems hmm. in their hands very easily. And it's easily concealed. It could be a great backup gun. Is, do you know if there's like holsters being made for it already or is it still too Yeah. Much? Yeah, there are. There are holsters being made for it. And I'm I'm wanting to say it, it holds eight in the magazine. I'm trying to. Wow, three eighties have kind of come 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 and gone and come back again. Mm-hmm. I remember way back in the day, Mossad. I can't remember whether he was for it or against it, but I remember him making a big statement back in the like early nineties, and then they came back, and he wrote a couple of books that kind of changed a few things. I think um, now they're back in again. But you say you Mm -hmm. think this thing is great. I do. I think it'd be extremely popular. It shot in the accuracy testing at seven yards. It shot one to two inch groups. When I took it out to to 25 yards or no, to 15 yards, I just went out to 15 with this Mm -hmm. one. And it it spread out a little bit. Because you don't really have sights, right? It does have sights, but they're not meant for targets. Yeah. They're meant for, but still, I mean, if you're talking about um, up to a four inch group, that's center mass. That's true. At 15 yards, so. So when the ladies were shooting it and you thought that the control was really good, Mm -hmm. where was the market headed at first? I think it was headed right to this group of baby boomers, whether you're a man or a woman. I really do. Oh. I do think it is. And Smith has not ever come out and said that, but I do believe that's what it. Separate. Let me talk about the trigger a little bit, too. You okay. will not be disappointed. It's crisp, and it's really nice. It's got a great, you can hear the reset, and it's consistent. It's not gritty. Sometimes, actually, even with a Walther recently, I was a little surprised at, um, not the Creed, but the other one. Oh, what was it? That's the gun anyway, I was trying to remember it. I couldn't remember it, the Walther. Uh-huh. And it was a little mushy. So, how it kind of travels, and then it kind of goes... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I don't really think I like this very much. <laughs> but not this one. No, no, the trigger is really, really nice. So, yeah. I'm so grab a, here's grab a picture oh, go ahead. to put in show notes to make sure that yeah, you um, do that they can see it as they as you're talking about it. Yeah, and I just want to explain too that one of the reasons it's so easy to to rack is because it's a hammer fired rather than striker fired. So when you rack the slide, that doesn't mean it, the um, it doesn't require compressing the striker spring as part of the process. So it just merely cocks the hammer, so it's a lot easier. That's why it's ah, easier. Ah, okay. Designed mm-hmm. from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. So. Did you do? There did you have it. Did you do the uh, the different ammo for this one too? I did. I did several. I did personal defense loads, target loads. And then I, uh, we, I, I went into different shooting scenarios, you know, behind cover, concealment, moving. Um, the women that came over that were, I think they're 64 and 70 years old, and they were shooting it, and they were doing multiple targets and headshots after about 50 rounds each from about, oh, I'd say three, and then I put them back at seven yards, and they were able to hit center mass, and then they were even able to do headshots. And they're not, I mean, they're not competition shooters or anything, so they, I mean, it wasn't fast, no, but still. 
yeah. a parking lot situation, especially with a center mass on this thing. I, hopefully it would stop somebody. Hmm. Change their uh, mind anyway. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Add, attitude. has got a gun. <laughs> attitude adjustment. Let us move. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the other good thing about a gun like this is if you get it for your mom or your grandma or whatever, and she realizes I'm going to have to work on my grip. There are, there's a whole world of benefit to that for an older woman or a man working on grip and forearm strength, because that really goes when they get older, you know, even just picking up groceries or whatever. So it's an, it's a good thing if you can get them excited about improving their grip for the gun, it'll be beneficial all around. Oh, cool. That's so, you know, for some reason, I, I, my mind just went, when you said baby boomer the first time, I was thinking babies. So my mind was like, why are the, are the younger people using this gun? It's like oh, backwards. <laughs> hey, let me tell you how much it costs. This is, okay. the, this is the kicker. $400. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Huh. So there you have it. Might have to show these folks to, pictures to my mom. You know, I think she probably would like it. Yeah. Cause mom's like, I, I want a gun, but I don't know what I want. And I was like, uh, man, that's like the wrong question to ask. We could be in the store for years because I'll just be pointing at this and let's try this one and pointing at that one. What do you think of that one? Let's go shoot this. And mm-hmm. so I'm still going to uh, do that. But I, I think you should try it. And um, hmm. I'd be I'd be interested to know what she thinks about it. And also, the capacity is eight plus one. And it's nice. not seven. So I knew it was like seven. I was trying to remember. Like seven plus one or eight. Hmm. Oh, so many guns. So little time. I know, right? Do they have um, the lasers for those too? Like, like uh, different makers have yeah. those little accessory yeah. lasers. Oh, nice. Yeah, because it has a, a rail on it, so you can put a lighter laser under. Nice. Under the frame, if you want, and then you could also do something on top if you wanted. For a red dot, red dot, or thinking about mom's her nightstand gun. Mm-hmm. It's a good idea. Uh, the trigger, the trigger pull was the weight was five pounds. Well, the average about five pounds, one point five ounces. So that's not bad. Well, that's one thing you didn't talk about last week. You do a trigger test too, don't you? Oh yeah. You know what? I, I didn't see that. I was under the quilt and I had it written down. But yeah, absolutely, we do the trigger test. Oh man, how could I forget that? That's so. Especially, I live with a trigger snob. Really? So, oh, the bomb. Yeah, total total trigger snob. What, what does he prefer, the New York style or a lighter? I don't know. I don't get into it. <laughs> Timney, expensive ones, you know. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> he has uh, champagne or caviar taste. He does. He does. But I'm I benefit from it because I don't even really know what some of them are, and he just puts them on my guns. I'm like, oh, that works, baby. <laughs> like it. Yeah, you guys are our best. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> I know, right? It's too cool. Get the triggers for Christmas. I know, I know. Barbara, thank you so much. You're welcome. For, for coming back on the show. Anytime. Um, ba- Barbara is the editor and founder of Women's Outdoor News. She writes for the Orz- Orz- Ozarkian mm-hmm. um, and some travel magazines. And mm-hmm. she edits a whole bunch. Uh, she is you're a photojournalist too, aren't you? Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. And then I write for all those gun, those nasty gun magazines. Can't I'm trust so, them, right? So glad you do. <laughs> you, you keep you keep them honest. <laughs> when I was at gun site last yeah. year, one of the instructors got up and he, there was a room full of gun writers and he says, well, you know, sometimes I read these gun magazines and I don't even know, like, what planet are these writers on? It's just some kind of some like reading French like is that the same gun I tried and I was just like hey dude do you know that you <laughs> these gun writers here are paying for your instruction this week <laughs> so whatever oh, I know right we get it kind of a bad a bad rep reputation sorry people don't know they don't know any better we just so. like guns and believe me, I've had some that one one gun in particular, and I can say what it is mm. because it's not even around anymore. It's not bad it was. It was a Taurus View. Do you remember that little revolver that had the plastic cylinder so you could see or a cylinder covering so you could see in there and see the cylinder turn? It was a tiny no. 
Nubby. Oh, I never saw that. That thing ate up my shooting glove and duct tape I, ran, I wrapped around my hand so I could accuracy test that little thing. I mean, it barely fit in the palm of my hand, and I don't have big hands. And when wow. I saw that I had to do all that accuracy testing, I was like, oh, man, this is going to hurt. So I got out my shooting glove, and then after it started eating through that, because mm. it was so rough and would um, move so much on recoil, I had to seriously got the duct tape out. Wrapped up my over my shooting glove, and it still ate through that. Oh wow! I bled for that one. I know, right? Mm-hmm. But they took it off the market, thank goodness. <laughs> I don't think it was because of my review, but it wasn't stellar. It wasn't. And that's the other thing, you know. I I don't make up stuff about guns. If I don't like something, I put it in there. If the editor takes it out, fine. If he changes it, then we have a, a discussion. But that's never happened. So yeah. sometimes things don't make it. I know, right? That's the, that's the best times, actually. Mm -hmm. They don't make all of it doesn't make it to print, but a lot of it does. A lot of the opinion will will make it because you know the, the other thing is I could have just had a lemon. Yeah, that a happens too. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining me you for bet. being being a part of the show, um, being in my life. I appreciate mm -hmm. you so much as a friend. Likewise. And looking forward to what you do in the future. I'll be following you. Feelings mutual. Thanks, Ken. How can folks contact you if they want to learn more about anything that you've mentioned in the last two shows? Oh, well, just check out womensoutdoornews.com. All of our social media outlets are listed there. And so any of those will do. You can just say, hey, Barb, I've got an idea. Or what do you think of this gun? Or what do you think of this fly rod? Or whatever. And um, just get in touch with me there. And either I or someone on on the team, we'll get back to you right away. Thanks. All right, I got a question for you. When is a gun not a firearm? When is a gun not a firearm? I'll wait. Oh, man, you going to wait for me to tell you? Okay, from a legal definition, in 46 of the 50 U.S. states, all firearms are guns, but not all guns are firearms. A firearm is a mechanical device that uses pressure from a burning powder or an explosive charge to force a projectile through and out of a metal tube, a weapon, especially a pistol or rifle, capable of firing a projectile and using an explosive charge as the propellant. That's a technical term for it. I think I got it from a couple of dictionaries. And the reason for my setup is there is also air rifles and pistols, which are commonly called BB guns or pellet guns, but which are not firearms since they use compressed air or CO2, not gunpowder to propel the projectile. And there's also toy guns such as airsoft or paintball. So gun is more of a general or broad term than could be applied even to toys, which look like firearms but or not. Ha! Can't tell me you don't learn nothing on this show. Well, this week I want to introduce you to thinking about air guns, pneumatic guns. You know, technology has gone a long way since the Red Rider BB gun. Remember that? How many of you had the Daisy Red Rider BB gun? Don't know what I'm talking about? Remember the gun they were talking about in the Christmas Story movie? I want an official Red Rider carbon action 2 inch your range ball air rifle. No. Shoot your eye out. Did you know that the Red Rider BB gun is a BB gun made by Daisy Outdoor Products and introduced in the spring of 1940 that resembles the Winchester rifle of the Western movies? It was named for the comic strip cowboy character Red Rider that was created in 1938. Yeah. And this gun is still in production, even though that comic strip was canceled in 1963. But this gun is old. Let me take you back to 1886. France had just given the bright copper Statue of Liberty to the United States. Coca-Cola had been just invented and was only available as a syrup mixed with soda water. The Plymouth Iron Windmill Company in Plymouth, Michigan, just outside of Detroit, had for four years been making iron windmills for farmers. However, a premium item given free to farmers who purchased these windmills was about to change that company's destiny. 
What was it? It was his daggone gun. Stay with me, though. I'm going somewhere with this. You see, windmill sales did not take off as expected, and the company came close in 1888 to going kaput. The vote failed by one vote, that of general manager Lewis Cass Hugh. And while in Chicago, air rifle made almost entirely of wood had been made since 1885 by the Markham Air Rifle Company of Plymouth. Hamilton was the first to develop the metal air rifle. After firing the gun, first at a basket of red ink-covered paper and then at an old shingle, Hugh exclaimed in the slang of the time, Boy, that's a daisy! And later convinced the board of directors that the metal air rifle to use it as a premium item. The popularity of the premium item was huge. Farmers were more interested in the daisy than the windmill, so much so that the focus of the company shifted from windmills to air guns. By 1890, the 25 employees of Plymouth Iron Windmill Company were producing 50,000 guns, most of which were distributed within a radius of 100 miles of the factory. But guess what? We didn't create it. Early air rifles utilized projectiles of 30, 35, or even larger calibers, and they were invented in Europe in the late 1500s. Lewis and Clark took such an air rifle on their historic voyage of discovery in 1804 to 1806. Although modern air guns differ from early versions, the basic principles utilized in the construction of air guns have been employed for centuries. The essential feature is that a compressed air is stored in the gun until the time of firing. At that time, the gas is released behind the projectile, which propels it down the barrel. The major difference between types of air rifles is how the air is compressed and where it's stored. Some of the early air rifles had a reservoir, and in some cases, the rear section of the stock, and in others, a hollow spear located below the action, in which air compressed by use of an external pump was stored. Part of that air could be discharged behind a projectile to drive it forward. So, air guns took off in the 1800s, but most of these low-powered models are cocked by some sort of lever, which pulls back a piston against a spring. The piston, in some cases, is little more than a washer with a leather collar that makes the piston have an almost airtight seal inside the barrel. And at the time of the firing, the piston is pushed forward by the spring to compress air behind the BB, which projects it out of the barrel, and doing what we like to do. Most such guns are lower in power than anything that are out today, but they're great for knocking down cans. From a technical point of view, any gun that launches projectiles utilizing compressed gas rather than producing gas, burning a propellant or powder, is considered to be an air gun. And in some cases, the propelling gas may be carbon dioxide, in which case the gun is actually a gas gun, but the term air gun is still generally applied to that. One of the great American air gun designs is the multi-pump, sometimes called the pump-up gun, which air is compressed by a series of pump strokes, and when the gun is fired, the compressed air enters the breech behind the projectile to move it forward. This type of rifle has been produced for well over a century, and with a maximum number of pump strokes, some of these rifles are pretty powerful. You can actually use them to hunt with. Okay, all of that background is for this. I want to introduce you to AirForceAirGuns.com. That's AirForceAirGuns.com, all one word. The mailman dropped off at my door an awesome box with a rifle in it, an air gun rifle, called the Condor SS. 22 caliber air gun has a tank on the back, kind of looks like a pony tank when you dive, that you fill up with 3,000 PSI. Rifle weighs 6.1 pounds. The length is 38.1 inches long. It has a suppressed barrel on it that's 18 inches long. Yeah, suppressed barrel. It's a bad mamma jamma. That's a technical term. Has a two-stage trigger. Has a safety. And having sent sights with it, I got some serious sights on this thing. And guess what? Depending on the charge and the pellet that you use, we're talking 600 to 1300 feet per second for velocity. 
Okay, so why would you need a suppressed barrel? Because this thing shoots out pellets so fast that it can break the sound barrier. So if you want to be nice and quiet, like an air gun should, and still be able to shoot long range, to hit small varmints, to practice in your backyard. Hint, hint, this is the urban gun of choice from now on. Now you're talking, yeah. Now you're listening to me, right? If you live in and around other people, if you've been thinking about getting a rifle to get rid of the fox, the possum, the raccoon, the groundhog, the rat that might be in your trash can, this might be it. This ain't no Daisy Red Rider BB gun, though. I'm telling you right now. This is a 22, but it comes in um, 0. 0.177, 0. 0.20, and 0. 0.25 caliber. Okay, this weekend I was going about to take this thing outside and uh, and wail on it a little bit. But you need some extra stuff to charge it. This one's set up for using a scuba tank. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I got found, I located a scuba place that rents tanks. And then if I'm digging this thing, I'll go ahead and buy my tank and then just go get it uh, refilled every once in a while. And I'll be doing a video so that you can learn all about it and see how this thing performs. Can't do it just as on audio. But I'm psyched. I'm happy. I'm really uh, into it. I'm going to be taking this thing around and showing people. And maybe we can get some leagues going on. You feeling me? All right. Check it out when you get a chance. Airforceairguns.com. And this one that I have is called the Condor SS. And after Barbara's tips about doing our proper gun review, I'm going to make sure I get different types of 22 caliber pellet gun ammo so to see which one performs the best. And I'll be shooting this from a rest and putting it into a bullet trap so that I can mark everything and show you by video. I got a new uh, GoPro. Got to learn how to use that. It's going to take me a minute, but um, check out the pictures that you'll see on the show notes for this episode, number 569 of the Black Man with a Gun Show, and tell me what you think. And if you have one of these bad boys already, I would love to know what you hunted with it, um, limitations and things that you've learned from it that I can share with other people. Okay? Cool and the gang. Have you heard my other podcast? Speak life. Proverbs 18.21 says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Join me in faith and be a part of my family on a podcast that gives you what you missed in church. Speaklifepodcast.com. Serving Jesus without boundaries. Speaklifepodcast.com. And we're on Facebook too. Speaklifepodcast.com. Well, that's it for all you hardworking people. Just want to remind you that common sense is like deodorant. Those who need it the most never use it. Thank you very much for joining me again this week. I'm hoping I said something that made you go, hmm, or I don't agree with that at all. Either way, send me a note. Let me know. Injured. You can find out more information about me at blackmanwithagun.com. Just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next time. Shalom, baby. Until next time, friends. To keep in touch with Ken and his cause, head over to blackmanwithagun.com. Blanchard.media. 